All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our double feature event today, um, Tea with a Naturalist and Backyard Jungle. My name is Laura Kasney. I am a conservation director serving Southeast Nebraska for the AmeriCorps Common Ground Program. The Common Ground Program holds educational webinars and events about conservation issues such as water quality, clean energy, and soil health. We focus on educating the public and preserving Nebraska's natural legacy. A couple items before we start. If you have any questions during the presentation, please type those out in the Q&A option or the chat box below and make sure to direct them to all panelists and attendees. Uh, we're gonna have the Q&A question at the end of both presentations. So if it, you're wanting to ask somebody specific, please note that in the question. Uh, we would also love for you to fill out the survey that's gonna pop up on your screen once the webinar ends. Uh, it helps us measure our outreach and is used for grant reporting purposes so we continue to, so we can continue doing events like these. Uh, today we are joined by Matt Jones and Jonathan Nicola. Matt Jones is a state program coordinator for the Nebraska Master Naturalist Program. He coordinates the training, recruitment, and facilitating of new volunteers. Uh, today he will be discussing the program and its role in conservation across the state. Uh, Jonathan, Jonathan Nicola has been a backyard gardener for 17 years, as well as being a member of the Nebraska Naturalist uh, Program. He has also authored three books relating to insects and as a certified pollinator habitat in his backyard. Today, he will be talking about his backyard jungle and giving a few tips on conservation practices he employs in his garden and in his life. So Matt, if you want to start us out. All right, I'll share my screen here. Get it. All right, does that look good? All right, so hello everybody. My name is Matt Jones. I am the uh, state coordinator with the Nebraska Master Naturalist Program. Um, I'm going to talk to you guys a little bit about what we do. Um, what our program looks like, what our uh, type of training we offer and what we do with our volunteer naturalists and just what all of that means. Um, I'm coming from coming to all of you from my office in the uh, Buffalo County Extension Building in Kearney, Nebraska. Our program itself is based in Lincoln um, out of the University of Nebraska. And over there I have uh, couple part-time employees. I have a part-time employee named Doug Wells who helps me out with training and a lot of various tasks. He's been with the program um, as an employee for about four years now, but went through the program as a master naturalist about five years ago. And then he also works as a uh, teacher naturalist at uh, Flat River State Park um, in eastern Nebraska. And then an exciting thing is we just hired here a few weeks ago a junior coordinator. Um, so we are developing a junior master naturalist program that uh, we, our goal is to have it piloted into uh, schools and after school groups um, here this fall. And so we officially um, were awarded a grant from the Nebraska Environmental Trust on that um, that was made official here last week and so that's an exciting turn into our program um, and then our program um, our program supervisor our sponsor to the university is Dennis Ferraro and so maybe if some of you have watched Backyard Farmer on NET um, may have recognized Dennis in the past he's the herpetologist or the snake guy so he's he's my boss he's who I work with a lot and then the cool thing is Jonathan's on this call today too Jonathan's also master naturalist and we've worked together on some pretty cool projects over the years. Um, so I'm gonna start off just a little presentation about who we are, what we do. Um, so we're gonna go along, so kind of a tagline with the program, explore, contribute, connect. And so that's how this uh, little presentation is organized. So what the Master Naturalist Program is, is really an adult education program. Uh, we take uh, people 19 and above, but then now it's a junior program. Um, our first, we're looking at grade levels, basically fifth through eighth. And then after this first year, we're going to start scaling it down to early elementary 
and then um, up to uh, high school level as well. So they're, um, the future of the program is going to be much wider. And so our, our, our mission of our program is to educate a volunteer network dedicated to promoting uh, conservation of Nebraska's natural resources. So that's, that's pretty broad. Um, so how we do that is through these trainings that we hold every year and we train people to become master naturalists. And so we'll talk about what those trainings look like here in a bit. Um, but some, a little bit of stats on the program itself is we've trained about 550 naturalists across the state of Nebraska. Most of them live in Lincoln and Omaha, kind of Southeast Nebraska, kind of following the population just layout of the state. I have about 50 here in central Nebraska between Kearney, Grand Island, Hastings, um, North Platte, Ogallala, and then up north around Sedford and Valentine. Um, but most everybody's out east. Um, but our naturals, they also track their volunteer hours um, because with each of our volunteer hours, we can measure the impact of our program. And so there's a dollar value associated back to each volunteer hour, and that's something like 25 or $27 an hour. Um, these stats look a little stale. I just updated them um, for a quarterly report here this last week, but we were actually about 100,000 volunteer hours and close to about two and a half million dollars on salary savings that we've provided the state of Nebraska by utilizing master naturalists and volunteers. And so our volunteers, they go on to, after they're trained and certified and complete their uh, training process, then they go on to volunteer with conservation organizations or um, within a variety of other outlets around the state, um, but they have they've they've uh, their their impact is worth at least about two hundred two point five million dollars since two thousand ten is when the program started. Uh, our naturalists have connected with it's actually about eight hundred thousand people. So within their volunteering, um, talking to people in outreach or people that they have been a part of a program when they've volunteered, um, and then we have touched on about 80,000 acres um, within our natural resource conservation work. And so, um, and then we've also worked with about, we started, started tracking here also threatened and endangered species in like state listed species that we've worked on. And there's been about 20 of those that are naturalists have been impacted. So going on further. So what our training looks like, so to become a certified master naturalist is the completion of 60 hours total of training that's in the classroom, presentations, but as well as hands-on activities. And so what we try to do in the program is do as much hands-on learning as we can. But these topics that we have here are all of uh, the general topics that we touch on um, in our, so we also do in our complete trainings. So we have what we call our complete trainings where we do the full 60 hours in one week. It basically turns into nature summer camp for adults is what I like to call it. Jonathan can attest to that. He was in one of these 60 hour tra like week long trainings. Um, we posted him up at the Nature Conservancy's Niobrara Valley Preserve near Valentine. Um, this year we'll be doing one in July out at Cedar Point Biological Station, which is a UNL campus um, out by Lake McConaughey. Um, and, but then we also have another shorter training called a core training, which we'll talk about later. But we cover all these different subjects like hydrology, geology, ecosystems of Nebraska, woodlands, prairies, grasslands, um, aquatic ecosystems. And then we'll have specific species sessions. So say one morning we'll do, you know, birds in Nebraska. And then the afternoon we'll do reptiles, amphibians, and turtles. And mammals and then each one of those sessions has some sort of field activity with it um excuse me and so these are these are the subjects we like to cover okay so going on with exploring we want our naturalists to then use what they've learned and so um these are about the four we have about four general categories that when our naturalists are volunteering their time it, encompasses um, these general areas. So the first one is interpretation and outreach. The majority of our naturalists volunteer um, in, in some sort of educational and outreach 
um, capacity, whether it's volunteering at a nature center, or for example, here we had master naturalists volunteering at the Crane Trust and Rose Sanctuary, and the Nature Conservancy in March helping um, lead tours during sandal crane migration. Um, but interpretive can be anywhere from working with youth to adults, any sort of educational opportunity to um, conducting or writing interpretive signage or like Jonathan and his butterfly book that we uh, partnered with him to do here this last summer. Um, and so there's a lot of opportunities there with interpretation outreach. Resource management is the next category. A lot of our naturalists who may not be, you know, the uh, step outside their comfort zone to talk to public speaking or anything like that will uh, they like to volunteer doing um, on the on the ground management type work. So anything from removing invasive species to habitat cleanup, uh, prescribed burns, helping out with um, restoration projects, that type of thing. And then uh, can then we also have a fair amount of naturalists who do citizen science or community science. So we're uh, game and parks is switch there is switching their terminology from community or citizen science to community science being more inclusive and um, but we got a lot of naturalists who participate in basically crowdsourcing data collection from non you know they're non most of them are non-scientists but have an interest in natural resources and can follow a basic protocol on help how to help uh, collect data for a variety of projects We've been fortunate to help out with endangered species. Um, so here a few years ago, 2014 to about 2017 or eight, yeah, about 18, uh, we worked with U.S. Fish and Wildlife and Nebraska and Parks and then the zoos in Lincoln and Omaha and uh, the NRD of the Lower Pot South to uh, do work with the endangered Salt Creek tiger beetle, um, which only exists in the saline wetlands just north of Lincoln. So we had naturalists going out um, to help feed and rear beetle larvae at the zoo in Omaha and Lincoln, and then um, come out into the field and help in the reintroduction effort. So without the naturalist program, a lot of those people wouldn't have been able to get involved in a project like that and that kind of high level working with um, an endangered species. Um, but then we also have people doing uh, spotted skunk surveys, um, bat surveys, a lot of pollinator surveys. Um, there's a really cool project com coming up called the North American Bat Monitoring Project. And there's a new coordinator for that in Lincoln now. Um, but uh, so they're looking at surveying bat populations in the state of Nebraska. And so they're needing volunteers for that. But basically you stick uh, some equipment on your car, drive a transect in the evening, picking up the echolocation of the bat so they can get an idea of species as well as uh, population. Um, so citizen science, especially in the year of COVID in 2020 has been a big uh, area for our naturalists to participate in just because you can find a citizen science project, whether it's through a platform like iNaturalist or SciStarter where people can, um, you know, there's nationwide data collection projects going on. People can tap into into those platforms to find things. And then lastly, we do outdoor skills. Um, a lot of our naturalists, lot, since we partner with uh, Extension and 4-H and Game of Parks, uh, we have naturalists who are uh, youth fishing instructors, hunter educators, help with uh, the Becoming an Outdoor Woman program and the outdoor expos. And so a lot of what Game of Parks um, does. All right, come on, slide. So our educate, so our training, we're really trying to equip our naturalists with skills and knowledge that then they can go and volunteer with our partners. And so um, we're partners with about 40 other conservation and education organizations around the state where a lot of our naturalists will volunteer their time. And, and so our training is led by resource professionals. So a lot of them come from the University of Nebraska, Game of Parks or conservation professionals like within the Nature Conservancy or Audubon or Crane Trust. Um, and really what I'm trying to do is create quality volunteer leaders that can connect with agencies and organizations across the state to help them reach their conservation 
goals. And then we're also just establishing a community of uh, conservation minded um, individuals. So going on the connect part, talking a little bit more about our partnership. Like I said, um, we have about 40 con or organizations that we're partners with. So anywhere from US Fish and Wildlife to National Park Service to then Game of Parks and then a lot of uh, nonprofit organizations around the state. So the zoos in Lincoln, Omaha and Scott's Bluff, the nature centers like Fontenelle Forest and Pioneers Park, the Audubon centers in, near Lincoln and Kearney, um, then several other natural resource districts across the state. Um, but we utilize our partners um, for facility use, instructors, volunteer projects, as well as continuing education opportunities. And we collaborate a lot on projects to work with. Um, so here's the, and then what we, then what we try to do is then help our partners out by providing them with master naturalists who are, most of them are between the, well, the program's open to ages 19 and plus. Um, the majority of them are in the ages of 55 to 65, and then about a third of them are in their 30s and 40s, I'd say. Um, but we do have college students, a handful. Um, a lot of them are parents or retirees or educators or people who have um, retired educators too. But a lot of landowners and people who just want to be role models and share their interest in the outdoors and um, nature and want to be able to share what they learn in our class with people in their audiences. And so kind of the, the background of our naturalists, the majority of them have a, uh, a like a bachelor degree or master's and a lot of them to enter our program kind of in their, you know, their second act. They uh, either empty nesters or people who finally have time to do um, to get involved in something like this. We get a lot of people I talk to who, you know, before they started off in their career, were really interested in nature and wanted to become a park ranger or, you know, a wildlife biologist, but then switched paths and now are coming back to, you know, their interests and their hobby. Um, and then we get people who, you know, who just want to learn more about what we have here in Nebraska. So we get people who are brand new to the state who will just want to learn more about our uh, ecosystems, our species, um, the diverse habitat that we have here and how to get connected with um, participating in conservation work. And so and we just got a lot of people who are just, you know, everybody really comes together in this program because they've got an ex excitedness to learn about Nebraska and then share, um, share what they know and what they, and um, what they've learned in their experiences over the years. So there's a lot of, there's a lot of interesting connections that happen, not only between our instructors, but then the, the people in the training themselves and the broader master naturalist community. Um, here's a look at what our funding support looks like right now. So right now we operate, like I mentioned earlier, a grant. We operate off of um, a grant through the Nebraska Environmental Trust as well as we receive some funds from Game of Parks and then we are administered and housed within the University of Nebraska. And then with our junior master naturalist program, we've also received some funding from the Hubbard Foundation as well as the uh, Papio Missouri River NRD. And then the uh, smaller text down there below is just a, a list of uh, some of our other partners that we work with um, for volunteer opportunities as well as facility use and a variety of other projects. Then going on to the contribute. So we got explore, connect, and contribute are three taglines. And so um, our naturalists, they develop knowledge and skills in their training. And a lot of it, you know, I'm honest with a lot of people, it's a lot, a lot of what we do is just giving people a taste of what is out there. Um, Cause the things that we're covering is we're just scraping the service. So like say we're having a session on fauna of Nebraska, you know, we're covering mammals, reptiles, and amphibians, insects, um, birds, you know, these types of things, these are in 
like college class, something that's a full semester. And we're trying to do all of it in like four hours. So we give a lot of people just, you know, an extreme overview. Um, but we try not to, the, the content level I tell people is it's about like a college 100 level course. So it's not over anybody's heads for the most part, but it's more in depth than what you'd get at maybe like a family program at a nature center. Um, but then we, you also walk away with some supplemental information, but then connections with our instructors as well as program partners on how to develop, you know, more avenues of understanding um, and continuing education. So we cover these four things, outdoor skills, resource management, uh, community science, interpretation. Um, and then really what we try to do is just serve the conservation community and our network of partners. Um, and then we also do a lot of continuing education. And so a lot of our naturalists who take our other, like I mentioned before, we had our complete training, which is that full 60 hours. Um, we also have another training that we call our core training. Um, and those people have to continue, complete quite a bit of continuing ed for that. So the volunteerism comes back into, we want our naturalists to use the information and their time and talent um, once they're trained and certified. So to maintain your active certification in the program or your active membership is to volunteer uh, 20 hours annually. So once you complete that, so that certification, then we ask our naturalists to volunteer 20 hours and we count um, travel time in that. And so a lot of times, um those 20 hours add up pretty quickly so if you're doing like a volunteer work day it's like an eight hour day and you drove one hour there and one hour to back that's 10 hours right there uh and then our volunteer hours we track all of those through our website we have an online um, database tracking system where you go in and say the who what when where of um your volunteer participation event and we're currently working with the university rebuilding, well, we're building a new database. Um, little inside baseball with the university. <laughs> Pushed us off, off a server and onto a new server, and now we have to rebuild the whole thing. But it should be done this week. Um, and then also with the continuing education, um, we, uh, we send out, we have a quarterly newsletter that we send out to the entire organization, but then we post all our events and volunteer opportunities on our online calendar and so we also share them on our facebook page and so we have went through we have all the conservation nebraska um all their facebook events we have those cross posted on our facebook and then we're slowly getting those up on our online calendar too but then we have other um opportunities up there with our game of parks or other other organizations, and then we as a program also do monthly continuing education. So we have our North American bat survey talk coming up here at the end of the month as well. So this is what some of our training opportunities look like for 2021. Um, so we're only doing three this year. Um, we're just happy to do anything at all after last year. We were only able to host, host one training last year and it was in October, but we'll be at SRAM at the New Education Center at SRAM Park near Gretna um, in May. And that training is our core 24, which I'll explain more here in a second. And then Cedar Point Biological Station in July, that's the full week long training. And then in October, we'll be at the Crane Trust um, with doing another core training. And so currently our SRAM and our Cedar Point classes are full, but I have a waiting list going and I just fill those up on Monday. And so, um, you know, if you see this tonight and you're interested in or you're interested in joining the program, definitely apply and you can get on a waiting list or sign up for the training in ALDA, or if not, you know, the future training in 2022. And so we usually announce our following year training in the fall. Um, and so we used to, we hope to have our 2022 dates actually out earlier. So probably August of this year. Um, and this, these trainings filled faster than any other trainings we've ever had. And I think that's kind of coming out of COVID. Um, there's just a lot of people who are excited to get back out there. Um, so I definitely encourage people if they want to learn more about what we do, um, to apply that's on our website. 
Um, and I'll throw that link in there in the chat later. Um, so a little bit more about the training format. Um, Laura could talk about this. She was in our act in our training that we did in October this last year. So our complete training, like I said before, is the full 60 hours that we do in a week, um, where we have about eight to 10 hour days. And so the topics are below. We cover interpretation, ecology, conservation biology. If the facility and the time in the in the um yeah, if the facility works out, we'll do outdoor skills. And we basically focus on non-consumptive outdoor skills. So we do things like archery, kayaking. Um, we've done shooting sports in the past. So it really just kind of depends on the location. But we'll cover topics in citizen science, resource management, all of these, geology. And the best thing is these are all Nebraska specific. Um, so you really wouldn't get a lot of this information unless you tell I tell people unless you went back to do like your undergrad in fisheries and wildlife or environmental science um, except for we're a lot more laid back and a lot more relaxed and <laughs> a lot more fun than you would in a college classroom I suppose um, but yeah that's that's a, another real draw about this program it's all Nebraska specific information so then the core trainings which we do uh, we call them core 24 because basically you get 24 hours of your foundational content over a couple of weekends and then you have a full calendar year to complete the 36 hours of continuing education um, to then bump you up to that 60 hours which is that threshold of become trained and certified and so for example our naturalists who are taking um, are training at SRAM this uh, this May. They have all of 2021 and all of 2022 to complete uh, 36 hours of continuing education, and that counts hour for hour. And so we help our naturalists complete their training with continuing education opportunities that we we do, or things like Conservation Nebraska. These um, these programs that they do are naturalists can participate in these sort of talks and use them for continuing education. Our partners, a lot of them do outreach programs that our naturalists can participate in and use that towards their hours towards certification. And then it's, uh, as long as it goes back to the mission of our program, you can count it for your continuing education. But I tell people your continuing education be, can be informal and formal. So what I mean by that with the informal part is, Say you're going to volunteer at, uh, let's say, Rose Sanctuary, and you're going to help remove some invasive species like musk thistle or purple loosestrife or oh, phragmites or something like that. And so if they're giving you 15 minutes to half hour um, information on, you know, how to identify, you know, some different basically instructions on how to do that volunteer um, activity and from, you know, techniques on how to remove those species, things like that. I would count that as continuing education. It can be as informal as something in a 15 minute chunk to registering for a, uh, a train or a, uh, excuse me, a conference. So for example, the National Association of Interpretation, they do conferences and that's kind of more formal something you have to register but and so it's in as informal as um something you need to do to you know for a volunteer opportunity to an actual you know full day multi-day conference that type of thing um, but the majority of our continuing education opportunities are free of cost the only time if there's um you know something you need to pay for is if there's any curriculum involved so say like you're doing a project wild training or something like that you know you might have to pay for the curriculum resources, or if it's a full-on conference, you might have to, but the majority, about 90% of what our naturalists do for continuing education, they're not, they're not paying for. Um, so, for example, here, th these are all the topics we are covering in our matron SRAM. So, these are the, the foundational 
the foundational content that we feel is um, good for all of our master naturalists to have as they go on to other things. To kind of sum up, uh, we've got about 550 master naturalists certified across the state. Um, this image is out at the Nature Conservancy's Niobrara Valley Preserve. This is, if you guys are familiar with the area and where uh, the Northern Chute is, this is where the river goes from. The Northern Chute is upstream for this, and then it's a really narrow section of the river, and then it opens up. And so this basically, this is where the Niobrara comes from. Upstream from this is where a lot of the canoeing happens. And then downstream from this point on, it becomes a shallow braided river, kind of like the Platte and the Elkhorn system. Uh, and then some more, another stat. So our volunteers have saved about two and a half million dollars. Conservation community. And then we've worked with actually about 800,000 people. And so that's my information. Um, our website is right there. It's nemasternaturalist.org. And you can find, um, our application on there and more information about our training and more information about what we do as a, uh, a program and to kind of sum up my time is I wanted to share with you a little three minute video that gives you a little um, more information about our naturalists um, a perspective about what what they do so I'm going to stop sharing I'm going to load this other video My mother told me we were supposed to learn from cradle to grave. The second step is turning around and sharing it. I wanted to become a master naturalist because I wanted to learn more, all the way from rocks and waters and insects and plants and trees, and you get it all, and it, it's just, it's so exciting. I started looking online for conservation groups that I could possibly join and uh, came across the Nebraska Master Naturalists. If you like anything out in nature, it doesn't matter if you're a gardener or if you're a birder or whatever it is, I'd say take the classes, you learn so much, and then I think that's where you're going to find where you want to channel your energy. I love the Master Naturalist program and I got into it because I was a newbie here in Nebraska and I thought what better way to finding out about my new state than joining an organization that teaches about all the things that I love. Helping people fall in love with nature is going to get them to want to help nature, you know, and help preserve it in the future. If you're interested in nature and you care about nature, it, it, you learn so much and you can do something about it. It's just really enjoyable. Everybody I've met through it has been great. If you join the Master Naturalist program, you will find that you have a bunch of new friends that want to encourage and support your love of nature so many different organizations and amazing people have come into my life that I have connected with and learned from because of the Master Nationalist program. So many organizations are in the need of volunteers. And think too, it doesn't have to be 50 hours. It can be one hour a month, one hour a year, but you are so important to the organization. That's what the Master Nationalist is all about. I've retired now and I can I have the time to do this stuff and, and it gives me a chance to learn more and, and I think everybody should strive for that. Since we're all volunteers here you can come up with an idea and if you want to pursue it it can happen we can make it happen. The Master Naturalist programs let you be uniquely you anything you want to work with that excites you, that is your passion, you will find a spot to be able to volunteer.
So that is pretty much what I had. Um, so like I said, if you guys are more interested or want to learn more, you can find out uh, on our website, master nat or ne master naturalist dot org. So I'll pass it back on to Laura. All right, thank you, Matthew. And mm -hmm. the link for the website is on in the chat for anybody. Um, so if we want to move on to Jonathan, whenever you're ready. Sorry, I was on mute there. All right. Okay, so I think my part of this uh, presentation today is threefold. One is just to talk about me and what I do and what what fuels me as someone who's um, someone that's active in conservation in Nebraska, and also to be a bit of a real life example of what Matt was talking about. Someone that went through the Master Naturalist program. And then a little bit at the end, talk about what I'm passionate about, which is around insects and gardening and that kind of things. Um, that's probably more than the 25 minutes I have, but I'm going to do my best to compress it. And I always love to talk to people later. And I want to just emphasize a couple of things. I will talk about master naturalists more uh, as we go through it. But like, I don't have a science background. I wish I had a, had a science background in um, my educational experience, but I didn't. Uh, it's not intimidating at all. I never had any issues with where I was uh, with my background. And really, it's really easy to do. I'm not retired, by the way. <laughs> so I, I'm, you know, even if you're not retired, it's something, uh, certainly there's constraints in my life, but it's been, it's been something I could fit in really well. And I'm somewhere between that first timer and the person re, um, sort of refinding uh, their interest in the outdoors. So that's kind of where I came from. So uh, so I'm just going to dig right in and invite you, like I say, to my backyard jungle, which is, uh, that's my Instagram handle. So <laughs> I always use that a lot um, when I give presentations. So uh, first of all, about me, uh, my wife and I have four kids. You'll see them on, the, I think, the left side of your screen there. Uh, they're a little older than that now. The oldest is 14, the youngest is seven, but I love hauling them out and seeing nature. And I'm born and raised in Kearney, Nebraska. Uh, Matt and I are actually about a mile apart right now. Um, his mom was my elementary art teacher and we went to church together. So we're all, you know, Matt and I, we have a history, but that's, uh, that's my basic uh, background. So what, what led to me to where I am now and what I'm gonna talk to you more about later. Um, that's my parents' house in Kearney, Nebraska. They still live there. They're never gonna move, whole marriage, that's it. But my mom loves, she grew up in on a farm and she loves the prairie um she would go on trips like to, to the to the Niobrara River when I was a little kid I didn't even think about the fact that someday I'd be going to the Niobrara River for my master naturalist training but she's loved the master naturalist or loved the Niobrara loves prairies she would she would she's the kind of person that would get native seeds and plant them in her yard um and when I was a kid the teachers at our school, I went to the school two blocks away, three blocks away, they knew my mom had a lot of native plants. And so in fourth grade, when they did the Nebraska section of the school curriculum, they would do field trips to my yard to look at all the native plants that my mom had in the yard. And I was so embarrassed by that. Um, people coming to see our messy yard with all these, these plants. Uh, lo and behold, uh, my mom planted some metaphorical seeds in my life that I wasn't aware of until until later. So um, the next thing that kind of got me was my wife and I lived briefly in Michigan and uh, the house came with a garden, already sort of plotted out. And I just said, what the heck? I'm gonna plant a vegetable garden to see how it goes. And so I did that. That's an early picture of my, of my vegetable garden back in the day in Michigan. But there was something funny that happened to me in the garden which was this insect that I found. I planted some asparagus and this insect showed up and I'm like, what is this insect? Um, Cause I'm just, what is it gonna hurt my plant? What is going on? 
And lo and behold, I find out, uh, shocking, it is an asparagus beetle. So not that creative, but I was just fascinated by the idea that where was this beetle before I planted asparagus? Like no one else had asparagus. There wasn't, as far as I know, I don't know where the nearest asparagus crop was in my neighborhood. How did this beetle just show up in my yard? And it just fascinated me. And uh, there were other experiences like this is a robber fly, one of my favorite insects. And uh, this isn't the actual robber fly, but I remember seeing a robber fly snag a wasp from midair in my garden um, and eat it. And that was just like amazing, just happened right in front of me. Um, these are bees that I saw um, kind of spending the night all grouped together like that on a, this is also on asparagus. So those things really, uh, they really shaped kind of my interest in insects. And I started taking photographs, then I bought a nicer camera and a nicer camera, and it just kind of spiraled uh, to where I am now. And I'll, I'll talk more about that in a little bit. <clears throat> the other thing that really shaped where I am is the master naturalist training. As Matt went through, this is some pictures <clears throat> of my group at the Niobrara Valley Preserve um, up in uh, Brown County, uh, Nebraska. And uh, just some, it was a great experience. Uh, Matt actually took my, one of my talking points. So maybe I got it from him back in the day, but I always call it like science camp for adults. So maybe I got that from Matt back in the day, but it was a blast. I loved it, just soaked it all up. The days went so fast, I enjoyed it. And, and whether you do the, you know, little, you know, bits and pieces along the way or the whole week at once as a master naturalist, I just had a great time with it, so. Just some, uh, some experiences I captured there. So what was an, another thing that really got me where I am now? Um, and this was a little later on. And one, one of the, um, I worked with a uh, lepidopterist from Elm Creek, Neil Danker, uh, to make a couple of butterfly guides. He was the brains, I was the photos of, of the process. Um, so that's on the right there on the screen, which is a more recent thing. But I made this book for my kids and I decided to sell copies to other people and just printed them myself. I sold, ended up selling like 400 copies and, and I got a lot of great feedback about it. Uh, so I loved it, it was a great experience, but I found that what was neat about it is I just did it. Like I just, you know, the, we talk about these things and we wanna share our, our story, we wanna contribute and I just did it. And it was amazing, like once you had a book, it was like, it was almost like a credibility, I mean, I just, I'm not an entomologist, I'm not a scientist, I'm just an average person who loves this and leans into it. And, but me doing that um, just led to more opportunities that the Master Nationals program in this led me to more opportunities to be involved in conservation. And um, so when I did the book, you know, lo and behold, people started asking me to talk about insects. And so I do that all the time. I, these are different pictures of me talking to classes and the Rose Sanctuary Kids Camp, and there's at our local greenhouse where I did a presentation on um, insects in the yard and stuff like that. So it just it just it just has been um, kind of going from there. People keep keep asking me to go and talk. I'm even wearing the same shirt in one of the pictures, but um, but it's just been something that's really grown um, thanks to just going out there and putting myself out there. Another thing that came from a lot of this is again, you just put yourself out there. You do master naturalist and you just see where things take you. And I'm on the board at Rose Sanctuary, the Audubon Center in uh, uh, south of Gibbon, Nebraska, kind of south in a little east of Kearney. And uh, obviously very active there with the um, Sand Hill Crane migration among other things. But one of the great things about joining the Master Naturals program and those hours might look daunting to you, but if you love what this, these things, like for me, it's easy. I, I get my hours in my sleep almost because these are things I love to do. Like I, I'm on the board, I help at the sanctuary, I do butterfly counts, I do these butterfly guides. It's just, the hours just sort of stack up without me really having to try that hard. Um, but that's another, another part about me. Uh, I also enjoy, oh, I'm also on the um, Nebraska Invasive Species Council. So that's another thing that I do with, uh, with my time. So we make recommendations to the governor and the legislature about how the state should approach uh, plants and animals that are invasive. That's something else I do. And then I, I love birding. So that gets me out and I get to explore Nebraska. Uh, I, 
I always, I've been in all four corners of the state looking for birds and insects, but uh, that's something that really, um, really drives me as well and uh, is, is a lot of me. And then I, in my, in my free time, which I don't have a lot of, I also coach track and cross country at Kearney Catholic. And what I love about this and why I think, why I encourage people to consider um, the Master Naturals program and learning more, digging into these things, is that when you're passionate about something it, and you begin to educate yourself, it starts to touch other people. Like I can't help but talk to my kids that I coach about bugs and birds. It just flows out of me and they love it. They also know in part because they become genuinely curious. Like I have kids bring me bugs and like, hey, what is this, Jonathan? And um, I had one girl who's, who's telling her parents, they told me later, my daughter came home and she was telling us all about how vultures kettle, do kettling, you know? And they're learning all these things because of my passion and sharing with them. They also know that I'm willing to stop a workout in the middle of a workout to explain what species of lady beetle this is or what that bird is calling in the background. So they, they, um, they know how to pull my strings as well. But uh, so I, and these kids that are learning nature because it's coming out of me because I'm learning it myself. A lot of them still follow me on Instagram and follow my posts and like pictures and are learning things. And so just like my own kids, I don't really push them, but it, um, it's something that's sort of transferred naturally to them as, as they go through. And actually two of my runners have gone on to run at Concordia uh, for cross country and their coach is a birder. So I always joke with them that I'm training them to be good runners and also relate to their coach when they go to college. So that's, um, that's sort of a funny a little thing. So as far as how I've applied it in my own life, um, I love being in the yard and gardening. Um, and there's a one picture of my yard. Um, what I have become is I, I love native plants and landscaping. Um, I basically buy plants for only one purpose now, and it's to attract insects to my yard. <laughs> so that's like the old, that's my, my number one priority. Like, what are the, what is this going to do for for insects in my, in my yard? And um, I just live in the middle of Kearney. It was a, a lawn that was completely grass when we purchased it. It's a, a large lot for in, in the city. Um, but I've, this is just one corner of it. Um, I still have a lot of grass. I have four kids, three of them are boys and they want to throw a ball around. So I haven't got rid of all the grass yet, um, but I've sort of warned my wife that when they're gone, I plan to replace all the grass with um, some, kind of, uh, some kind of native prairie deal uh, in the back, including more water and things like that. So uh, she's, she's forewarned, but, um, that, that's what I've done in my own yard and how I've transformed it. And that's kind of how I spend a lot of my time. I love to just walk around my yard and, and enjoy that. And like I referred to before, it's become a really cool thing for my family. So my kids are just naturally picking it up. Like I, they honestly have less aversion to holding bugs than I do. <laughs> honestly. I mean, my 10 uh, year old uh, in particular, um, you know, one day, uh, I don't know if you remember a couple of years ago, there's this big painted ladies push in Nebraska, big migration. They were everywhere. I found my kids outside, like conducting science experiments one day on their own. I don't, I didn't tell them to do that. <laughs> they just went outside and did it. Um, that's an early picture I like because that's when my daughter could still get away with dressing her brother up in girls clothes, but they're, they're like six inches from a bumblebee, you know, no big deal. Like they're, they just have a comfort level. My 10 year old wants to be an entomologist. Hopefully he sticks with that. We'll see. Um, he did that in school one day. And then he's, he's even been tapped for some row events to, to be at uh, tables to talk to adults and kids about bugs. Um, so it's just really proud of my kids and just experiencing nature. That's one of my favorite photos, just the joy that they get to experience when they um, uh, enjoy insects in our yard. That's a black swallowtail butterfly. Um, out in the row, in river at Rose Sanctuary, you know, those kind of things, searching for insects at a park near Kearney together. So, uh, and we even did a little podcast once in a while. So it's just been really cool and something I think is uh, achievable for a lot of people, whether your grandparents or parents. Again, your passion, they will, it'll pick up pieces of it. My daughter, who's not as into it, 
doesn't even realize how much more she knows about nature than her than her friends. Uh, she thinks she's like the one that's not into it, but she knows a ton. She knows she probably named 50 birds if she really, really needed to. So uh, just it's just really cool experience for my kids that I hope will stay with them. And then um, before I get into kind of the details of some of the insect, um, I know we have 10 minutes here, so um, I'm just going to I'm actually going to skip it. I, I'll just skip this. Um, I was, um, I don't know if you're familiar with the show Blacklist or not, but the the writer and executive producer of it is from Kearney, lives here, a uh, great guy, uh, part of part of Nebraska, even though his job is more in New York and Hollywood. And uh, he actually wrote my name into an episode of a serial killer that used insects to kill people. Um, so if you want to look at the Blacklist, my name got in an episode, which is was a lot of fun but um my mother didn't like that I was a killer but I thought it was I thought it was humorous so I'm just gonna I'm just gonna skip that because uh, you can go look at this more time so uh anyway I just what I've what I love my passion is really insects most of all I love birds too um, but insects really draw me the most and I think part of it just because they're, they're they're so amazingly beautiful and amazing and fascinating um, but you don't really get to see them very often like they're uh, you know, we can all see, uh, you know, a deer or a crane or a bear with our naked eyes. I mean, insects are really hard to, really hard to enjoy without seeing them through the magnification of macro photography. And so that's what I spent a lot of my time doing. These are, these are leafcutter ants from Costa Rica, actually. Um, but they just, you know, they see, they just do amazing things, um, just have amazing color, uh, amazing characteristics like you know this 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 is a, a bee fly that reminds me of like um uh oh man forgetting the movie now what's um anyway there's i'm trying to remember the movie with um, steve martin when steve martin had long nose you know this he, when i see these always remind me of that um but uh just so many amazing things like flies that look like wasps and bees you know 95 percent of America thinks they have a bee in their yard. It's a harmless fly that's pollinating their flowers. You know, things that we don't get to discover. There's another bee fly, um, or I'm sorry, another, um, they call them surfid flies or flower flies that look like mimic bees and wasps. You know, bee, you know, people think bees are these black and yellow, you know, standard honeybee. Nope, there's a green bee, sweat bees, you know, things you discover, um, just amazing, furry bees, cuckoo bees. I always, you know, I always find this one funny because it looks like it has a smiley face on its head, but it's actually a pretty dastardly bee that lays eggs in the nests of other bees and basically um, um, parasitizes them in a way. Um, bees always like, I love this bee. It's a tiny bee I found with massive legs. It looks like it lifts weights too much with its legs, you know. This is a, this a tiny bee I only found because I was taking a picture of another one. It's that's as big as that's smaller than like the, the tip of a like the the edge of a pin, you know, that bee. Just the tiny size, but it's the complexity of it. Um, that's my favorite insect, the cicada killer wasp, which I don't have time to tell you why, but uh, you can check that one out. Our, our biggest wasp in Nebraska, completely harmless, unless you're gonna hold the female and like almost crush her in your hand never going to hurt you. Uh, but a lot of people get freaked out about it. Um, that's her doing what she does, which is lay eggs on cicadas. So I love talking to kids about that. It's a moth, you know, beautiful moth, um, red and black, another moth. So um, these are things I love to love to talk to people about and love to discover and um, uh, different kinds of butterflies, the snout butterfly, which I think is great. Lady beetles, cool story, probably the, one of the most tenacious predators in the insect world, but, you know, we put them on daycare signs in Kearney, Nebraska, you know, so just fun, fun stuff. Um, there's one devouring an aphid as a juvenile. So again, things that, that we just don't get to discover unless we, um, uh, unless we take a close look. So I'm going to go through these really quick. Um, so butterflies, this is my favorite photo I've ever taken. I know it's not an insect, so apologies there for people that are being literal, but um, it's a spider I found on a tree in the middle of the night in Costa Rica in a jungle. And I just loved how it blended in so amazingly into the tree. I just, 
that just blew me away. So a lot of cool things to discover. Um, where am I at on time here, Laura? We got five minutes left. Um, I'll just go really quick through, you know, if you're going to garden and you want to bring insects into your yard, um, think about blooming for all seasons. It's, it's not just summer. So remember, you have to have plants that bloom at all times of the year. So that's something to think about. Uh, it's good to have diversity. You don't want just one kind of plant. You want a variety of kinds of flowers and grasses. Um, also, you want like older cultivars, like some of the newer ones. They look like they have a flower on them, but bugs don't care. Um, and a lot of times you can tell at the greenhouse, you can tell which flowers the insects are going to and not going to. Um, but that's something to think about. Uh, mass plantings. Don't just buy one of everything, buy five, six, seven, put them together, um, have groups of plantings when you do that. Uh, pay attention to host plants. So pay attention to what butterflies like to lay their eggs on. So those are just like we talk about the, the monarch butterfly, but it goes for other insects too. Uh, don't forget grass and bushes. So birds and insects love to hide in bushes when they don't have those things, they often they don't go to those areas. And a lot of insects use grass to overwinter or to lay their eggs. So that grasses are oftentimes host plants. So don't just plant flowers. Um, weeds, I'll skip that one. Garden cleanup, I'm gonna get to that in a second. Uh, insect friendly setup, have water in your yard. Even if it's just a plate, maybe um, put some rocks in it so the insects can land on it and not drown in it necessarily. Um, birds in it, it doesn't just go for birds. Insects want water too. I see bees and wasps drinking out of my little stream. I have in my yard all the time. So uh, you need water. And again, it doesn't have to be complicated. It can be a little bowl or a tub with just water that you fill every day. Um, rotten fruit, you know, some people that attract butterflies or beetles put out fruit. I don't, I don't often do that, but you can do that as well. Um, bare ground. Uh, you don't just want grass or even in your, in your, in your garden area, just like um, wood chips or things like that. You want open grass areas because a lot of your bees and wasps are nesting other insects, native, really important insects nest in the ground. They, they burrow in the ground. And uh, so you need to give them that. So that runs, runs a little countercultural, but um, bare grounds are really important. Uh, leaf litter. Uh, again, this is back to that earlier point I made. Um, insects like messy yards. So again, I have grass. Um, I, every year I chip away at it and hope to eliminate it down the road. But they like a little leaf litter left out in the corner. That's a place they go to overwinter to lay eggs. Um, so it doesn't always have to be this clean. Have a clean yard, that's fine. But at least reserve areas where it's a little messy and things are left up. Like for example, I don't trim my plants in the in the fall. I leave everything up over winter. Um, that's that's important for um, wildlife. Um, shelter. So um, I think. Oh, here's a picture of an insect hotel. I think that's a UNL extension actually in Lincoln. You can build things like that that help give insects habitat. Those are fun. You can Google insect hotels and find out all kinds of stuff about those. Um, you can purchase bee houses. Um, they sometimes sell them in the stores now. They're getting kind of trendy. Um, just be aware, the ones that they just drill holes in blocks, those can often become infested with pests. Um, I, got, I get a lot of my stuff from a place called crownbees.com where they have reusable or clean things you can clean or throw away every year. Um, but that's, that's a great, I, I just put my insect hotel or bee houses back out. There's probably, probably like a couple hundred juvenile, well, they're probably gonna be adults any day now, but of bees and wasps that have overwintered in my little um, bee houses. Um, lawn care, um, you know, I would just tell you, I get it. You know, there's, there, there are bugs that we don't like. There are things like mosquitoes and other stuff. Um, I just would encourage you to think twice, three times, four times about ever using pesticides. I remember before I really knew what I was doing, we had a bad mosquito population one year and I did the whole mosquito spray in my yard and they fly at night. Well, guess what? We get up, guess what else we didn't get the rest of the year? Um, lightning bugs because I killed them all and I mortified 
but it was a learning lesson for me that you have to understand there's very rarely can you selectively kill any one insect and so I would just I know this crowd's is probably speaking to the choir but it's important um plant damage is okay you know a lot of people are worried about plant damage that's my roses the leafcutter bees cut holes in them all the time to lay to lay their eggs I love it my local garden greenhouse said I'm the only person I ever went to buy a plant just so bugs could eat it um and that's that's important to have those kind of things um, grass lawns are kind of wastelands for most insects, so just understand that. And uh, let's see, leaf litter cleanup, um, pretty obvious. Anyway, last thing I'll just say, um, go look for plants. I'm just going to skip through plants that you might like because there's a bazillion of them. I'm just going to tell you two places that I go a lot of times to find plants for my yard. One is Prairie Legacy, which is a supplier place you can go online and purchase native plants for your yard. Um, probably half of my plants in my yard are from there. They're based um, southwest of Lincoln. Great place to go buy native plants for your yard. Highly recommend it. Their customer service is great. They always respond to me. So check that out. And then also um, UNL has a Nebraska pollinator habitat program. And I like the application because it has a ton of plant suggestions on it. So I pull plant, I check that all the time to see what plants I wanna purchase. They're not all native. And so I'm not gonna get into like native versus non-native. So they're not all native, but they're not invasive. So you just need to make your own determination about if you want all natives in your landscape or not. But um, that's a great application. And I can, um, you know, you can check that out to get a quick screenshot or something. Um, but with that, um, so yeah, just Google those Prairie Legacy or Nebraska Pollinator Habitat and look up the application. Um, yep, check out my Instagram. I post pictures of bugs and birds. Check it out. I love to share. So Backyard Jungle on Instagram. And that's it. So Laura, I hope that I just kind of blew through that, but um, happy to wrap up there. So. All right. Awesome. Thank you both. Um, we did have two questions so far. If anybody else has any questions they want to ask, either Matt, John, both, uh, go ahead and put it in the uh, chat box below. Um, our first one, it was during the, during Matt's presentation, it was just asking, sorry, I have to scroll in and figure out where I was at. Um, but it was asking if you change, sorry, how often is the curriculum updated? And then is there an emphasis on climate impacts? Yeah, so our curriculum, we have a set of like objective like learning objectives for each um topic that we talk about but then we give it up to our instructor on how they want to get there um but usually you know climate change is a part of a lot of it um especially with our conservation biology and ecology session um but in every session you're going to get information um what you know from our instructors about you know, how is climate affecting these species and these habitats, you know, bird migration with um, habitat loss, things like that. So, um, and then there's also another program at UNL called Climate Masters um, that people can look into too. But with us, we don't have a specific um, climate session that we do. We've talked about it, but we haven't developed it yet, but this kind of a part of every session that we talk about. Um, so, okay, yeah. Thank you for the info on Climate Masters. I didn't know about that one. Um, yeah, they've been around for a while and they've been off, off and on, but I think they, I'm pretty sure they still, they still exist, or at least their resources are available to the public if they're not doing any you know, trainings this year. Yep, I see that on their website. They're still waiting for funding. Um, and then for the second question, it was towards Jonathan um, and Matt, if you have any input, mm -hmm. uh, can you just tell us more about certified pollinator gardens? Uh, they have some spaces with their young son that they've thought about getting them certified? Sure, I did that. So I did that, 
I guess about five or six years ago, and it's through UNL Extension. Like the link, uh, I saw Laura put the link in the chat, so check that out. And you know, there's nothing, there's no reason to do it. I mean, it's it's sort of, I guess it's kind of a pride thing. You know, you can you can wear the wear it with a badge of honor. But I, I suspect the reason that UNL does it is to help. It's a great way to create awareness. So I create it, and people like ask me about it. And then I tell someone else and then they put native plants in their yard or plants that attract pollinators. And so it's just a great way to or kind of spread the word. And um, they uh, um, have different qualifications you have to meet. So like I have to have a water source in my yard. I have to have a commitment to using like um, pesticides in a limited or non-existent way. You know, there's different things that you have to do and um, different plants. I have to have a certain number of spring, summer, fall blooming species in my yard. Um, anyway, so it was it was pretty straightforward and it's been a few years since I been, applied for it. But, and like I said, yeah, I love the application because I get plant ideas from it. Um, and, you know, like I said, some, some are native, some are not native, but they're all great for pollinators. And then you can just make your own determination about um, whether you want all natives in your yard or not. But but they they remind me of things like, hey, it's not just wildflowers it's also bushes it's also trees like it's not just a so anyway I like the program because it's a bit of a as much as anything it's a guide to help you get started when you look at the application to what you need to do like you don't have to know how to make a pollinator habitat before you do it because they tell you how and you just have to check off the boxes so I would encourage you to even if you don't apply check out the application for some good guidance so all right. Yeah, that's that's awesome. When I eventually get a house, I'm going to do pollinator gardens. Um, so we did just have another question pop up. Um, this one's just asking if there's any funding to do outdoor classrooms slash pollinator gardens for schools. This could be to either of you. If you have. I'll defer to Matt. That's more in his world. Um, you There's so I know like, well, we've worked with pheasants forever. Um, they do a lot of pollinator planting um, with like public plots with schools or in parks and things like that. It's not just on CRP land or conservation easement land. Um, but then things like Nebraska Game and Parks has their watchable wildlife grant. And there's been schools and um, educational organizations that have gotten funding about they're like they're small grants I think three to five thousand dollars or something like that I may be wrong I, I'm I want to say that's right but I'm, <laughs> sounds right in my head but they what well, Nebraska Watchable Wildlife will also um, uh, help pay for those things as well and then I know there's there's others out there too there's other granting organizations that'll help out with that I think more off the top of my head though, but Game and Parks Watchable Wildlife is the one for sure that would, that I would hit up, and then Pheasants Forever is, is also a good one. Awesome. Okay. Well, thank you both for sticking around a little bit longer today. Um, both of your presentations were awesome, and for anybody. Uh, in the webinar still, all the links are up from what they talked about during their presentations. And then once you exit the webinar, you will be asked to fill out a survey. It really helps us so we can continue doing and working with people to bring, uh, to bring information to the general public. Um, so since we are at 740, I think it's a good time to stop. So again, thank you both Matt and Jonathan. Um, if you've seen the chat box, you're getting a lot of thank yous as well. And then I think we are done for tonight. Thanks so, for letting, letting us speak to you. It was awesome. All right, everybody, have a good night. Take care.